I'll call the community safety meeting for Tuesday, November 15th, 2022 to order. Um, motion on the minutes, motion to adopt the minutes of the meeting for October 12th, 2022. Any uh, omissions or changes? Move adoption. Second. All in favor? Thanks. Uh, the next committee meeting date will be December 13th, 2022, four o'clock in council chambers. Um, additions to the agenda, I have a 6.1, uh, a referral on peace officers, and 6.2, a referral about public safety offices. Anything else anyone wants to add? Okay. Uh, motion on the change to the agenda? Move. Second. All in favor? Thanks. And first item, Community Safety Animal Protection Services Monthly Activity Report, September 2022. Uh, Ms. Lloyd. Good afternoon. Nothing to add, happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions? We received a report. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. Pass. Item number two, property use and parking enforcement monthly activity report for September 2022. Uh, to the chair, I have nothing further to add, but I'd like to take this moment just to welcome a new addition to our bylaw enforcement team. Uh, we've welcomed on board uh, Mr. Ken Ng, who comes to us from having a 30 year plus career in law enforcement with the Vancouver Police Department. Uh, Mr. Ng will be in charge of our property use and parking uh, enforcement sections. Um, I'm open to questions regarding the report. Okay. Is he here on the screen or do you just... Uh, I think you can... Should we swipe? Should we find him? No, I'm not seeing him in here. Okay. Well, welcome Mr. Ng if you can hear us and thank you for that. Uh, any questions for on item number two? Yeah, sorry, Chair. Uh, uh, Ken is here. I'm having some issues with my video. It was working earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, uh, Mark. Uh, I, I look forward to working here at the City of Richmond. As Mark mentioned, I had a 30-year career with the VPD. I retired in January, so I had eight months off. Now I'm back to work, and I, I look forward to it. Uh, the the culture that Mark's created here is uh, very good. I look forward to working with him in the city of Richmond. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Councillor Hobbs. Thank you, and, and through the chair. Well, first, uh, yeah, welcome, uh, Mr. Ng, and I can verify through voice recognition that that is Ken Ng that was speaking to us. So I think <laughs> Councillor Heed could verify that too. So because welcome we have aboard. A voucher. <clears throat> Just um, a couple comments about uh, property use. In particular, uh, on page uh, 15, I think it is, we'll start talking about um, some of the B&B &B and short-term rental issues and boarding and lodging uh, as well. And, you know, could you just explain a little bit about what the situation there is? Because I feel like it's probably something that's a little bit underreported to begin with. And also, I just have a concern, if you could address um, the issue of the owner slash uh, operator issue when it comes to operating B&Bs or short-term rentals. And the concern I have, uh, one, is that in my decades of living in Richmond, I've, I've never seen so many people rolling down the street with suitcases in hand. And so I, I realize with the B&Bs, we have that 500 meter rule, but uh, with the short term rentals, I don't believe we do. And so if you could just first of all, comment on the rationale for why we would have operator along with owner. Uh, owner, I understand, that makes sense. But an operator seems to open up rental properties to various short term rental um, situations that might not be strictly according to our bylaws and i think it also increases the incentive and the profit incentive uh, when it comes to rental properties which takes them away from long-term rental properties actually because you can make a lot of money with short-term rentals so i do have a concern uh 
with that issue the owner fine but when you have something that says you can have an operator okay. to me let's that means let you can have an staff respond i think okay. cecilia is here ready to respond actually yeah through the chair if i could jump in first because i bit i have a bit more history on the genesis of all the short-term rental uh, files um so for the BNB, that was the original short-term rental that council approved, and that's probably maxed out at about 70 or so unit in the city of Richmond uh, due to the um, um, separation, the, the space, spatial separation, so we can have no more than that. And then we heard from uh, some of the public that came in during that whole consultation that we were discriminating against um, multifamily homeowners, so if somebody in a townhouse or even an apartment have a, a because of the high cost of um, living in Richmond, that if they have a spare bedroom and they don't want to have a long-term uh, roommate and, and they are already occupying the space, could they then uh, use one bedroom or something like that for short-term rental? We also heard from the sports um, uh, hosting side of folks, and they were wanting to make sure that there are, there are spaces for hosting teams and uh, uh, exchange and all that kind of stuff. Of course, you can already do host uh, students on exchange program regardless, but some of these folks said they want to do it sort of more longer term, like multiple um, times a year, and they don't mind um, declaring their, their income. So this is a legal way of um, people being able to assure to be assured that these are legal uh, short-term rentals. Thirdly, for the owner occupier, it's council's desire to not have um, any short-term rentals that is not occupied by either the owner or a the, the tenant. Should the owner already rent a house to a tenant that is not taking away from long-term rentals? So, in the case of multifamily, should the owner um, be amenable to the tenant renting a room out in a rental property and the strata council also approved that address both the issue of strata council not necessarily wanting short-term rentals in the building uh, if it's not permitted by either the strata mm -hmm. council or if the owner who rent a space to a, a tenant not want the tenant to be able to rent out a room those will not be permitted. So that's a little bit of the history. Um, and I will let Mark um, follow up with other questions on the uh, current trend, like what we're seeing post pandemic, the numbers are starting to come up because travel is becoming more um, more thing now. So I'll let Mark, Mark will have more of that information. Um, through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, there, uh, our response model is we will generally prioritize calls that have come in regarding uh, short-term rentals, and we investigate those as quickly as we can. We understand that there is a number of postings through various online sites, and we are engaging the operators of those sites to get access to some of that data, and we are also engaging third-party uh, tech companies that have the capability of doing scrubs of these sites and to be able to differentiate between what are duplicates, what are the actual counts. But it is correct that there is seems to be an uptick with the restriction, the relaxation of travel restrictions in regards to short term rentals. And in this case, these are unlicensed short term rentals um, regarding the specifics of um, what we require for owners or operators, they need to produce identification, they need to be registered, uh, they need to provide tax assessments, uh, they need to provide a utility bill, all this to demonstrate that they reside uh, within the premises. Sure, just I'll make a short follow-up if I can through the chair. I understand all that, and I understand that for boarding and lodging, there are legitimate things like farm workers, for instance, um, need boarding and lodging. My concern is this, and, and I'll follow up offline with you as well, and maybe there's some action that can be taken later. With short-term rentals, there is, for instance, no 500-meter restriction, right? To the chair, um, through the chair to Councillor Hobbs. Um, so short-term rentals as a category is defined in Section 5.20 of the Zoning Bylaw. Now, the particular item that has a 500 meter radius around it 
is what we call a bed and breakfast type of uh, short-term rental. That 500 meter radius restriction does not, however, apply to the five other types. And those five are hotel, motel, boarding and lodging, agro-tourism, community care facility, and dormitory. So the only 500 meter restriction applies specifically to a bed and breakfast. And what differentiates a bed and breakfast from a boarding and lodging is primarily a boarding and lodging has a maximum of two people that can reside there, whereas a bed and breakfast can have more than two. And typically it's understood in a bed and breakfast that there be some provisioning of meals. Great. So um, one last point on this, and I'll talk to you later about it, probably offline. But when you have people who can be the owner or the occupant, that, in my opinion, can be subject to some abuse. Because what, it can, what can happen with that with multiple residents, for instance, you can have somebody as the occupant who is you know, a tenant or a renter, but also essentially an employee of the owner of the premises. And that's a very lucrative business to get into, short-term rentals. Uh, I'm talking about single-family dwellings, not strata issues right now. So that's the concern I have, and it seems to be occurring more and more, but that's anecdotal information. So perhaps down the road, we might be able to get some more information on whether or not this is an actual issue. And, and when that happens with single-family dwellings, and it turns into a bit of a business where you have five or six houses, that does take those houses off the market as long-term rentals for families or people who are working in the community. So that's my concern. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McNulty. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a couple uh, quick ones for me. On our Greece, uh, we, uh, it seems you've had 731 inspections. Well, wherever the, uh, our Greece uh, um, police officer is, and thank you very, very much. Uh, are we seeing a, um, a reduction in uh, issues with Greece, given our uh, educational system? I see we didn't uh, uh, actually uh, write up any citations for it, but that's a tremendous number of ex inspections. That's 73 a month, 75 a month almost. Good job, but uh, are, we, are we finally getting through to folks? Through the chair to Councillor McNulty, um we do have a representative from Public Works who will defer to you for more specific information on that topic. Yeah, to the chair, to Councillor McNulty. Um, yes, most of our stuff we do with education. So again, the intent is not to do um, to the violation, but rather to educate the businesses. And so we have been finding that has been quite successful. Yeah, well, keep up the good work. Um, uh, that's, that's always nice when you see something like this uh, on it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, property um, uh, use calls for service. When I look at unsightly premises for 2022, you're going to uh, surpass the uh, 2020 numbers with, with 428, and um, you've issued 18 uh, offenses. Um, are these just neighborhoods um, complaining about neighborhoods, uh, single family, I, I, I'm assuming, uh, in terms of the unsightly premises? Through the chair to Councillor McNulty, predominantly we have a large amount of uh, unsightlies regarding um, uh, issues of vegetation overgrowth. We can have unsightlies regarding debris or material. But as we have the ebb and flow of growing conditions, that seems to correlate more strongly with the uptick uh, in unsightly complaints. Okay, okay. Well, again, another good job. And the other one uh, I wanted to bring up, uh, obviously, your, your largest of community bylaw offenses was the soil deposits and removal, 47. What's happening out there? Is there are these uh, developers or are these uh, uh, general public? Through the chair to count. Through the chair to Councillor McNulty, there is one specific property which uh, has been repeatedly uh, the, the focus of bylaw enforcement action and will likely be uh, have an escalation in that action in the form of a long form prosecution to provincial court. Uh, and this particular property, unfortunately, uh, hasn't acquiesced to that enforcement action so far. Okay, well, great. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to 
just raise their hand on your box, not on your, not through Zoom. So if you can just tag that. Uh, Councillor Wolf, I noticed you were next. Um, I'm not on committee though, he can go, uh, Mr. Councillor Heath. Councillor Wolf. You want me to go? Okay. Uh, my questions were all around the soil activity, page 15, 16. Um, first off, does staff have any more information on the three properties of the stop work order? I note that Smith Street is just uh, west of Costco. Granville Avenue is on ALR, just east of Four Road. And Triangle Road is just down from Richmond Ice Centre. Anything in common about these three? Or have these properties been on stop work order before? Thanks. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, uh, all three of these properties are in related to fill that was done without a permit. Um, we can get into um, more detailed information uh, in the form of a memo or report back on that specific issue. Uh, thank you. I, I'm not requesting that, but if committee members would wish for that, that that's fine. Uh, through the chair, my other question involves, um, in the same section, the soil bylaw officer, um, who seems to have been pretty busy for September, had 60 site inspections in the month and 30 properties that are considered non-compliant that they're uh, monitoring. Um, I've talked to a few people in Richmond and I am unaware of the complexities of soil deposit proposals, but many of the people who I've spoken with are very frustrated with the process. And I assume they're also the ones listed as non-compliant because they get kind of, they think they're doing the right thing and then they're told by our officer that, oh, you've done that wrong, you got to hire a contractor and undo that and then redo this. But they just feel they don't have like the proper steps of what to do next and, and, and they're just left in limbo. Uh, I'm not sure if we can address that with on our city's webpage on like a bullet point procedures, these things have to be done in this order or could you direct me where to find that to share with them? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, we have a bulletin on our website regarding soil uh, uh, deposit applications. Um, we also uh, work in conjunction with the Agricultural Land Commission. We have multiple provincial statutes that we also have to oversee as well. Our our soil officer is is quite a, a busy person. Um, but he's also expert at guiding applicants through the various levels of government, inclusive in terms of applications that go before council uh, regarding soil deposits of a certain amount. In addition, we require uh, the input of the Food Safety Agriculture Advisory Committee as well. Ultimately, the success of many of these applications are in the realm of the Agricultural Land Commission, and that is just a result of provincial statutes. But we do make a number of step-by-step uh, -step, uh, bulletin uh, processes that they can follow, and we can provide that information to you uh, as well. Uh, thank you. I'll just I'll request you. I'll email you and request that exact thing. Thank you so much, Councillor Heed. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, my question is to Mr. Carrado. Do we have bylaw enforcement officers working on weekends? Through the chair to Councillor Heed, uh, yes, we, we do have a, a mixture of property use bylaw enforcement officers. Uh, we do also have our parking enforcement officers as well that do work on weekends. Okay. Follow up to that in relation to uh, several complaints regarding the cement trucks that are uh, operating usually on Saturdays and cleaning just on the airport. Uh, at or the airport road just adjacent to the uh, Dinsmore Bridge. Uh, do we have enforcement officers that deal with that? And, and there are several complaints that have come to me with respect to that. And when the public does phone the public works yard, they're told that there are no bylaw officers available on weekends to enforce that. Through the chair to Councillor Heed, so Sea Island proper, we don't enforce, um, but in the uh, approaches to Sea Island, we would. In the case of uh, work that is being done uh, outside of certain hours, let's say it's a construction or a cement truck delivery at 6 a.m., we don't specifically have patrols open at that time. So that would be a noise complaint. And during those periods, 
Uh, we work with our colleagues with the RCMP to respond to those calls outside of that normal period of time. But on occasion, when we do have a number of complaints regarding a specific site, we will conduct a joint operation and usually stake out a particular operation and see if we can uh, you know, enforce and catch people in the act. Uh, just a uh, clarification, Mr. Corrado, this relates to cement trucks after they've uh, delivered their cement product to whatever building that are cleaning up and uh, cleaning their trucks right on the roadway just before BCIT, between the Dinsmore Bridge and BCIT. And you're shaking your head in agreement? Are you aware of that? Uh, this specific complaint I'm not aware of. Uh, I can look into this further. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, and, and just one follow-up question with staff. Um, thank you for this report. Given the, the change in COVID protocols and the increase in people using um, short-term lodging and rental. Is there a communication plan to reiterate the rules around it? And do we have a public listing of who is registered for short-term rental so that the public can see whether or not their neighbor is? In fact, if they are seeing a stream of, you know, people toting suitcases coming in and out of a house and whether or not they should then call and report. Uh, to the chair, uh, currently we have 54 licenses for bed and breakfast. Uh, we have 17 for boarding and lodging. I believe most of the building licenses data is available on the website. I can look specifically and re report back as to whether the bed and breakfasts licenses are uh, specifically listed. In particular, uh, given that uh, applicants need to know if there is uh, another business within 500 meters, that would expedite the process if we did push that information out there. They could see that there is someone within 500 meters and might potentially dissuade them from applying, knowing that they wouldn't be able to be accepted. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, I see Mr. Ng, we can see you now. So, hello. Uh, we can greet you properly now if you'd like to speak again. The floor is yours. Uh, to the chair, no, I think um, I've said enough. I won't take the time of everybody's uh, for the meeting. Okay, well, nice to see you and welcome to the team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, do I have a motion on number item number two, property use? And all in favor? Thank you. And next item, Richmond Fire Rescue Monthly Activity Report, September 2022. Uh, Chief Wishlove. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Hello. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear us? I can, thank you, and I have nothing further to add to the report, but I'm happy to answer questions from you or your committee. Thank you, we have a couple questions. Councillor Day. Thank you very much to the chair, to staff. I read a story in the Richmond News about a homeless person that was sleeping in a dumpster and uh, that got subsequently dumped into a dump truck and thank goodness the driver spotted it. And I understand the fire rescue uh, uh, saved the fellow with la the help of ladders, is that correct? Through the chair to Councillor Day, that is correct. Uh, we, we were uh, summoned through 911 and responded and our technical rescue team uh, was able to extricate the person uh, actually, he climbed himself out of the dumpster through a ladder and then uh, actually was assessed by BC Ambulance and left. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I'm not on this committee anymore. I, I was given a new assignment, but I'm wondering if this committee wouldn't like to write a letter of uh, recognition to the operator of that dump truck, because had he not been on the ball, I mean, that man or that lady, wh whoever that homeless person was, could have been killed. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Heed. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Chief, <coughs> could I just uh, ask a few questions regarding Table 1, the total incidents for September 2022? There's a significant increase of medical calls. I'm not sure whether your personnel uh, have any idea why that is or any analysis that's done to show that, uh, you know, even in the five-year average, it's extraordinary. Is that due to COVID or do we have an explanation whatsoever? Uh, through the chair and councillor, he thank you for the question. Um, there's a, a number of factors that are still at play with respect to mm. our first responder calls uh, in, in the community. Um, 
these numbers as we're seeing them now are actually getting much closer to what our responses were for medical calls pre-pandemic. And then during the pandemic, uh, while working with BC Ambulance and BC Emergency Health Services, the calls for service for first responders, such as our firefighters, were uh, reduced in order to protect our firefighters from all of the exposures potentially. Uh, as the pandemic has receded, uh, we've been working with the BC uh, Emergency Health Services to slowly uh, redispatch our folks to calls that we were responding to pre-pandemic. So those numbers are increasing, but they are increasing back to where they were prior to the pandemic. And just follow up to that, Chief. Uh, with respect to your personnel, who often the, are the uh, initial responders to these medical calls, do we have excessive wait times for EHS personnel, or are you satisfied with uh, the times? Through the chair to Councillor Heed, uh, we, we have experienced uh, uh, rarely times where our crews are waiting uh, for significant times for ambulances to come and uh, transport patients to the hospital. But presently, uh, we are able to manage all of our calls for service without any significant interruption in our other duties. And uh, through the chair, the reason why I ask that with this uh, up and coming, I hope, significant changes to EHS with respect to medical calls, uh, I'm just wondering if, if those extraordinary calls, if there's a pattern that we can address that and make sure that we get that to the governance board of EHS who's looking at the changes. Are you on any committee or do we have access to any committee so you can get that there? Through the chair to you, Councillor Heed, I am. Uh, I do serve on a number of uh, regional and provincial committees with the Fire Chiefs Associations. And so I'm also aware of that work that's being done uh, with respect to the changes that are coming for not only BC Ambulance, but also the licensing for our uh, first responders as well in, in Richmond Fire Rescue. Um, I'm happy to uh, draft a, an understanding and a report of what we're finding out uh, presently right now and present that back to the committee if that would be helpful. Yes, that would be helpful. One more question, Madam Chair. And uh, Chief, it relates to the emergency programs. Uh, do we have uh, any uh, programs in place where we can start to work with neighborhood associations, neighborhood watches, or areas in that nature to really bring up their level of preparedness if in case we have a disaster here in Richmond. Do you work with that or do we have a separate or do you leave it up to the uh, emergency operations people? Through the chair to Councillor Heed, um, uh, there's two uh, components I can speak to on that. Number one is our emergency programs uh, branch that works uh, under the roof here in RFR. They're the city's emergency program team. Uh, they are currently managing a national inclusive resiliency project uh, in partnership with Canadian Red Cross. Uh, Richmond is one of five communities across the country that's been selected to participate in that. And <clears throat> part of the outcome of that is there's five specific uh, demographics that the team is reaching out to uh, in promoting um, preparedness and communication to those, those particular demographics and preparedness. The, the second component, uh, more specific to your question, is we do uh, connect with um, community groups in, in the city and help them prepare as resiliency hubs uh, is the term that, that I use. And um, in particular, uh, we've worked specifically just recently with the Sea Island Community Association on some of their preparedness activities. And through our emergency programs, public outreach uh, program, uh, those resiliency hubs are gonna be more of the forefront coming forward as we identify those, those community hubs to identify with. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Councillor Wolf. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the Chair, just two questions. Um, the first one is ties directly to what uh, Chief Wishlove was speaking of the, on page uh, CS21, the Inclusive Resiliency Grant. My question was about that preparedness party in a box program. Uh, so if, if approved, we'd get that. Whose program is that? Is that a made in Richmond program? I've tried to look it up because I'm doing an emergency preparedness grab and go kit uh, lesson with my students this week. So I thought I'd try and tie it into this. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, that is going to be a made in Richmond program. Uh, through our emergency programs team, the public outreach coordinator has created a draft program and the, the inclusive resiliency grant would uh, fund that. 
and whereby uh, community groups or school groups or uh, even small neighborhood groups would be able to um, borrow that kit uh, from emergency programs and use it uh, at an event. We would actually attend if that was going to be helpful to them and have somebody facilitate that in order for them to learn more about preparedness and uh, take away some good learning lessons from that. Uh, thank you. Just a follow up on that, if I may, through the chairs. I can see that maybe even being a synergy with the Block Watch program, uh, where there's already established groups around the city that maybe they could be encouraged to participate in, in that when, if approved, of course. Um, the second um, topic um, relates to a, a couple of comments I've heard from residents who live on Number Six Road, uh, just down the road, uh, just north of Fire Hall Number Seven. Um, that's at like Six Road and Westminster Highway, Crestwood uh, area. Um, and so the, the concern is that when the fire trucks leave and they head north on Six Road, they blast um, the high decibel sirens. And many of the residents on the east side of the road, well, that's the only side that has residents. Many of them are elderly. Uh, they're ALR properties that have animals. And if they're, they're ongoing distress uh, that they and animals feel with the sounds of the, of the high decibel fire truck sounds and, and the staff who are in there have ear uh, protection on, but the people who live in the old houses or with animals or in their drive, driveway don't have that protection. And um, I'm not sure if there's a, a, a range in volumes that could be controlled because so many of these people have said there's no cars at all on the street and the fire truck's coming and it is just extremely loud. Could, could there be a, a lower level or, or does, that, does that lead to cars coming out, not hearing them and then getting hit or something? I don't know if, if you could speak to that concern that residents have in that area. Through the chair to Council uh, Wolf, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, the use of the emergency equipment, such as the sirens and, and the lights, is is really for two reasons. Uh, number one, when our crews are responding to an emergency and there's there's a, a life and death uh, potential, um, the use of that emergency equipment protects not only my staff but also the public because the the crews are uh, have the ability to exceed the speed limit uh, safely. They they would be able to navigate through an intersection if there was no other traffic, and so the emergency equipment would. Uh, allow other motorists coming that uh, our staff may not fully be aware of uh, to tell them that, of course, the emergency uh, vehicles are, are proceeding through the intersection. Um, what I can do is I can certainly take a look at the responses that we've had uh, north and south of, of uh, the fire hall on number six road in the past year and see what that number is. Um, the unfortunate side is I, I, I'm going to decline to tell my staff not to use that equipment uh, during the emergency responses. But I can share that uh, some of the newer apparatus that we've procured in the last uh, recent years does have um, updated technology on the, uh, the siren noise. And so there's certainly different types of noises that uh, we have available on different trucks. And uh, as, as time moves forward, of course, technology advances and we have the ability to uh, apply for and adapt new technology on that. So that may very well be an answer uh, in the short or medium term that uh, may not impact uh, those residents uh, just as much. Thank you, just a short follow-up. Uh, I appreciate that, thank you, um, through, the, through the chair. The, um, I, I live out right down from the Hamilton uh, station and I've heard some wacky sounds come out of those trucks. I'm not even sure what it is sometimes until I see it. Um, so you're right, there's lots of new technology there. And, and so my, la my last question is, if um, you're gonna check into um, complaints that were received, could you just tell me, tell us um, who or where, where or who would a resident complain to to get it logged into this place that you're going to check? Who do they call or co to complain so you hear about? It? Certainly through the chair to councilor Wolf, uh, the, the easiest way is for them to send it directly to me and they can do that through our, our generic fire at richmond.ca email. Okay. Um, my administration staff will uh, capture that, review it and send it on to me. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Galanders. Thank you, Chair. I have just one question about the first responder um, medical calls by type on page 26. I'm just curious, um, is there anywhere where we can track outcomes? I was looking at the um, overdose 
poisoning has gone up to 38 calls in September for 2022. And I was just wondering what the outcomes were for that, if you could, um, if you're allowed to share that with us, if the, they were people were saved or how many deaths. Through the chair to Councillor Golanders, thank you. Um, we as first responders don't often have uh, all of the information for what the, the final outcomes could be uh, once uh, those patients are transferred into the care of BC Ambulance. Um, BC Ambulance crews take over care and control of the patients and we return to quarters for the next call. So often we don't know what the outcomes are beyond that. Um, and especially once that patient arrives at the hospital, if they are transferred to the hospital, it's uh, uh, private information that we would not be privy to for sure. Uh, I can share that for those 38 overdose and poisoning calls that uh, we responded to in September, <clears throat> uh, when our crews were on scene and, and dealing with the patient, uh, out of the 38 calls that we attended to, two uh, resulted in occasions when our crews had to administer naloxone. So that's a, a 5% um, of those calls where we actually administered naloxone to patients. And that's a, a very normalized average of all of the poisoning and overdose calls that we respond to normally over the course of the year. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, I'm wondering if we can get that naloxone doses administered either in your verbal report every month or just tuck it in the report somewhere and then we maybe have a feel for what, what's happening. Because uh, obviously there are <laughs> regular poisonings that happen and then there's poison drug supply or just drug supply issues. And I think that's valuable information for us as a council to have a, a feel for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can certainly uh, uh, take a look at the, the medical calls that we respond to and the tables that I submit for the reports and we can update that table. Thank you. And if it's not appropriate in a public, then it can maybe come in a, a closed meeting report if that, if, if you feel that's necessary. Thank you. Okay, do I have a motion on the recommendation? Second, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, uh, fire chief briefing, come back. Sorry, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I actually have uh, no further briefing for you this afternoon. Okay, thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, yep. uh, um, I think uh, uh, if I could get the chief back, can you remind council when the uh, toy drive is so that they can show up to support, please? I, I certainly can, and I'll, I'll also offer some space for uh, uh, OIC Dave Shohan to speak about that too. The uh, RCMP and Richmond Fire are um, going to be collaborating on a, on a toy drive this, uh, this Saturday at the Lansdowne Mall. And I understand um, Mr. Shohan has an extra bit of information he can share about what's gonna be happening at that toy drive. Yeah, they, they... Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose we'll wait till the RCMP briefing for that. Uh, number five, RCMP monthly activity report. Uh, Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Um, I also wanna welcome retired Inspector Kenning um, look forward to meeting with you, Ken, and uh, working with you and Mark on uh, issues related to our city. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't have anything to add to the report, but i um, happy to take any questions you may have for the council. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Galanders? Mm, that was oh. just still up from before. Oh. All right. Councillor Heed? Through uh, Madam Chair, uh, Chief, uh, a, a couple of issues relate specifically to crime reports or possible crime reports in the First one I want to talk about, and I, I brought this up uh, in council about these warming centers that we're putting together, uh, Chief. And I'm just uh, one wanting to know if your crime analysis people will be going, whether it's concentric circles or something of that nature, to really look at uh, the increase in call load for your members to that particular area whether it's related to social disorder problems or whether it's related to some type of, of crime issues or just uh, just complaints. And it, not only the warming centers, but the other homeless resource centers we have, including the uh, uh, residents that we have, the uh, container residents, I'm not sure they're proper categorization of them, the one just off of Alder Ridge Way and Bridgeport. 
to see, Chief, if, if you guys are keeping track of that, or your crime analysis people are with respect to calls for service. Uh, to Councillor Heath, uh, to the Chair, um, I am not aware of us keeping specific stats uh, in relation to warming centers, but we do have our ComStat program, and uh, that is something I can always uh, look into it. Thank you. And uh, carrying on, I'm just wondering if we can get a report on that. I, uh, Chief, it's nice to hear you use the words, which is music to my ears, ComStat. Um, Certainly, that is a program that I'm very familiar with. And further related to that is you, you provide the crime analysis with respect to some of the crime categories occurring here in Richmond and, you know, the hot spots. And uh, generally, when you look at them, they're around our major urban areas, such as Three Road and elsewhere. Uh, I, I guess my follow-up, Chief, and uh, whether you're able to uh, share that with us or not is, uh, do you come up with formal plans in responding to those particular hot spots, or do you, and do you have a baseline whether you will go with some type of uh, uh, special uh, enforcement in those particular areas? Uh, yes, uh, to Councillor Heath, to the Chair. Uh, those our Comstat reports um, currently um, they are on a biweekly basis, but we'll be changing the form on a monthly basis and. Our teams, our SMT inspectors and other teams, um, they meet regularly to uh, look at our CompStat reports, identify the high-risk areas, and formulate a response uh, uh, geared towards those um, uh, those areas that need police attention. Uh, Chief, through the chair, I'm just wondering if, if we could share that. We're not looking for the intricate details regarding it, but it'd be really nice for at least the, the committee to have uh, some ideas because when I look at the, uh, for example, it just right here in my binder is the Thefra model around number three road and all that. Uh, what uh, type of response is to that versus just having the uh, the uh, hotspot mats provided? But maybe that's more of a discussion for a closed meeting once we get into more strategies and specifics. But I think that's something, Chair, Madam Chair, that. Uh, uh, the chief could provide. I think a lot of that, uh, the public would be aware of that. I'm not interested in specific uh, intricate details of, of some enforcement plan, but I'm, I'm just interested in the, the concept of the approach that the chief, I'm sure, is taking. Uh, if I may, uh, to Councillor Heed, uh, to the chair, um, the ComStat reports are reviewed uh, by our teams and a response is formulated. If there is a for example, a prolific offender or prior defender who may be targeting a specific area, whether it's theft from auto or theft off auto, um, we will tailor a response uh, geared to, to, to that uh, sort of activity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank Thanks, you. Chief. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Al? Yes, I have a question regarding uh, the uh, number um, on CS39. Uh, table two violation tickets issue, and uh, in the table you can find uh, an item called vehicle related, and in the footnote it re also refers to um, vehicle deficit uh, defects, uh, for example, no lights or no insurance. Now I've seen an increase um, in the number of, um, of, of I mean offenses um, under this heading. Um, I don't know how many of those are actually um, driving without in insurance. So of the 129 cases reported, what is the percentage of um, cars without insurance? I asked the question because, you know, some people have expressed a concern, saying that some time ago, uh, ICBC uh, did not require a label to be put on the, I mean, to, to, to verify that they have already paid for the insurance. So, do we see an increase of people driving without, like, without insurance because, you know, the, the requirement is being waived? Uh, thank you, Council to Councillor Al, to the Chair. Um, I'm sure that we do have a breakdown of those stats, but uh, clearly here they are all grouped together. But um, we can certainly break it down, and then if there is a concern of uh, 
um, more uh, vehicles on our roads that uh, don't have insurance, and um, we can certainly look at that as well. Okay, great. Councilor McNulty. Yeah, uh, just quickly, um, in on our page uh, CS thirty three, the number of mental health uh, incidents, uh, uh, is, which is really down, and obviously, I'm glad to see it is down. Um, do we know how many of these are repeats, uh, repeat calls, possibly? And it would be uh, to, interesting uh, to note that. Yes, to Councilor McNulty, to uh, to the chair. Um, we do have um, um, stats that uh, that record uh, our repeated uh, interactions with some of our mental health clients, and that is something that I can look into that as well. Yeah, it would be good. And I guess the other question is, I've always talked about possibly, I know with um, CAR-80, CAR um, and I wholeheartedly approve it, is to hopefully uh, we get a social worker involved with some of these people, and. Uh, the Vancouver Coastal Health and uh, I'll be able to deal with them. So uh, anyhow, it's encouraging and uh, keep up the good work there. Um, I'd like to, if I may, uh, uh, Chief, give a shout out for our uh, community police station programs. And I look what the volunteers have done since your last report. Um, actually, it's quite impressive uh, when you look at uh, what's happened on CS 36 and, uh, and 37. So. Uh, Kudos all round for, for that and, and uh, to the detachment uh, uh, for the good work that's being done in our community. So, huge thank you. And thank also you. say the fire, too. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have a motion for? Move receipt. Second. All in favor? Thank you. And OIC briefing, Chief Superintendent Chauhan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just. Uh, few uh, verbals for the uh, committee. Um, first, uh, while the COVID-19 pandemic uh, had put a damper on community events, uh, this year was the first year since the pand pandemic began that uh, city sanctioned Halloween fireworks uh, displays were authorized at the Sea Island Park in Burkeville and uh, Minru Park. Uh, Richmond RCMP had a robust operational plan in place, working together with our community partners to have um, adequate level of um, policing response to Halloween activities. As far as the fireworks are concerned, there were no reported incidents uh, from Burkeville or from Inru Park. However, we did have one um, a file where, uh, which involved a young 13-year-old uh, who was trick-or-treating near her townhouse complex who had unknowingly consumed uh, candy that contained THC. The uh, packaging on the uh, candy had uh, clearly written on it that it was a THC-infused uh, gummy rope. Uh, the child was transported to a local area hospital by her parents after the child became sick. Uh, concerned that other candy-containing THC may have been handed out, so the parents uh, reported the incident to the Richmond RCMP. Based on our investigation, this appears to be an isolated incident, as no other reports were received. Uh, a media advisory was uh, sent out to our citizens that uh, if anyone else located THC-based candy amongst their children's streets to contact the Richmond RCMP. Um, so far, no further incidents um, have been reported to us. Secondly, um, Consul Yang's uh, regimental funeral ceremony were held on Wednesday, November 2nd at the Richmond Olympic Oval. Thousands of police officers from across Canada and the United States came to pay tribute to our fallen member. In addition to police officer attendance, all levels of government officials and local citizens gathered to pay their final respects to Shailen and to show their support to law enforcement. I wish to thank the management of the Richmond Oval for facilitating this event um, and for everyone who was engaged uh, for all of their contributions for a very memorable tribute to Shailen. If I may add just uh, two quick updates. Uh, the Remembrance Day ceremonies were back in, fill, uh, back in uh, full force this year uh, with tremendous response from all of our volunteers, organizers, uniform partners, veterans, members of the community and city staff. Uh, we had a wonderful ceremony in uh, paying our respects to our veterans. And finally, uh, Richmond RCMP will be hosting our eighth annual Richmond RCMP toy drive on November 19th 
at Lansdowne Mall, starting at 8 in the morning, uh, in support of the Richmond Christmas Fund. And this year, I have volunteered to uh, go in the dunk tank to uh, take the plunge along with other, other community members to raise funds in support of the Richmond Christmas Fund. I know that in the past, uh, this event has raised uh, significant uh, funds for those in need, and uh, I am hopeful, hopeful that uh, this year will be no exception either. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you for in advance for the work you're going to do there. Uh, we have a question from Councillor Hobbs. Uh, thank you, and through the chair. Uh, yeah, before the question, yeah, I did want to mention too that uh, I thought your members and the fire rescue members looked very sharp on Remembrance Day. So that was good. Uh, just a question on a <clears throat> memo that came through to us on the report uh, for repeat offending and random stranger violence in British Columbia. And I don't know if you've had a chance to review that or if you could make any uh, comments on it as far as how it impacts Richmond. There's the three recommendations in this memo that uh, BC is going to be acting on first out of, I think, the 28 recommendations. And the, uh, probably the first one in particular is uh, of the most interest. And it might not be fair because you might not have had a chance to look at it yet, but do you have any comment on that and how it might impact Richmond? Yes, thank you uh, for that question to uh, Councillor Hobbs <coughs> here. Um, I have briefly looked at the uh, report and um, I know there are a number of uh, recommendations that are geared towards the police. And um, I can tell you that uh, at Richmond Detachment, we, our investigative services, we have a very robust, uh, prolific offender program. Not only that, but also a priority offender program. So the prolific offender group is, as you know, um, are the ones who have been through the cycle and, and at the highest risk of uh, and, and have a history of repeated um, criminal activities. And then we have a secondary group that we know that they are at high risk of committing crime and we um, profile them uh, as a priority target. And our uh, different units from investigative services uh, review our both of these programs on a six week basis and um, depending on uh, the, the, the high risk and uh, the high level targets, um, proactive enforcement uh, efforts are taken. And, and recently, a few months ago, one of these individuals uh, was arrested with several property related offenses and um, was incarcerated for 180 days in jail. There are some other recommendations that are mentioned in the report, especially uh, looking at to reestablishing the prolific offender management program going back to 2008 to 2012. I will be looking at that uh, report to see what it entailed and if there's any additions or revisions that we have to make to our existing program. Uh, but um, there's many other things. Obviously, the report you know, uh, focuses uh, quite a bit on, on mental health related issues. So we do have our Fox City mental health uh, car. Uh, we also have a mental health liaison officer. So we are doing our best, uh, uh, given uh, the resources and uh, the, the programs that we have in place to ensure that if there's criminal enforcement that is provided, that is taken, uh, the criminal enforcement is uh, done. But at the same time, um, if there are any um, assistance or, or guidance or, or anything that we can do working with our stakeholders, in providing the support to these offenders, we are also doing that as well. Well, that's good and, and good to hear. I know that the report is relatively recent, so, um, but as we all know, um, dealing with prolific offenders and targeting uh, probable offenders is an effective enforcement tool. And I think it's good to see that the province is uh, backing this and hopefully uh, more resources will be forthcoming. So thanks for that. Look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Galanders. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a comment about Halloween, and I don't even know if this is the appropriate time to say it. It's my first community safety meeting. Um, it's just funny. Every year there's so much in the news about fireworks and municipalities banning fireworks, and people are so upset with the noise. And I just want to say that, um, like, our family and neighbours and friends have always really enjoyed that Richmond does, uh, like, sanctioned controlled fireworks events. There was, there used to be one at Hugh Boyd, um, but I don't think it happened this year, but I think there was one somewhere else, at Minaroo? Minaroo and Burkeville. Yeah, and I just, I just really wanna say, I really think that's the right approach because 
Um, the, the issue that people have with the fireworks are actually the firecrackers, which are illegal, and they're always um, been traded illegally, just like drugs, and, and teenagers get their hands on them, and, um, and they make the loud noise, and um, whereas the fireworks in that control area, I think that as long as, as the city has a fun event like that, then more people will go and be at that event rather than look for underground ways to do their own fireworks. So I believe that continuing with sanctioned events is, is the way to go. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, for, thank you very much. Um, and next item, 6.1, Peace Officer Referral, Councillor Heed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to ask that uh, this be referred to staff. Yep. And uh, what I'd like uh, staff to do is the feasibility of transitioning our bylaw officers to peace officer status. It is my understanding we're the only or one of a few municipalities in the metro area where our bylaw officers are not actually peace officers. And if we want to get to more of a protective service here in Richmond for our uh, community, I think that's something we should uh, explore at this particular time. So uh, the referral is to staff. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. That's fine on that Okay, one. so do I have a seconder? Seconder. Okay, does anyone want to talk about this? Mm -hmm. Councillor Golanders, are you speaking on the referral? Oh, okay, right. thanks. Well. Councillor Wolf, do you want to talk about yeah, that's right. that's, I didn't know this was coming. If I could, uh, through the chair, if, if I could ask uh, Councillor Heed or staff to, to just give a quick overview, what is the difference between a peace officer and a bylaw officer? Well, I think what we would do is we would have, um, in, in the referral, we'd get staff to outline what a police officer what a peace officer does how is it different from a bylaw officer and what it would take to then transition to a peace oh. officer i think that would be okay. a more fulsome sure. report so i think if 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 i may can can our referral be that staff report back on that outlines what a peace officer does how is it different from a bylaw officer and what it would take to transition our bylaw officers to peace officers is that it Work? Okay. All in favor of the referral? Aye. Thanks. Okay. And then number two? Yes, uh, again, a... Public safety officer, Councillor Heed. Madam Chair, again, a referral back to staff as it relates to our community police stations that we have throughout uh, Richmond. And in particular, we have an up-and-coming one in the Hamilton area, which I think is a, a very good uh, approach in this particular area. What I would like to... Uh, have staff do is review them to see what they would look like and whether we can look at Hamilton uh, currently uh, being more of a public safety type uh, approach, a protective services approach to be more inclusive of all of those services, uh, not just a, a community police office. Okay, so we'd like to understand what protective services approach might look like and how that could be integrated into the new and existing community police stations? And, and briefly, uh, Madam Chair, a protective service approach would include all of what we would categorize as being protective services for Richmond. It would include fire, it would include emergency preparedness, it would include bylaw officers, it would include police officers, of course. All of those uh, uh, stakeholders that have a real uh, good approach to providing safety for our community. Okay, so we're looking at an integrated uh, community stations, safety, public ser protective services stations, and what that might look like and how the possibility of how to create that in Hamilton and, and other community policing stations. Yes, Chair. Okay, do I have a seconder on that referral? Second. Okay. Uh, any questions on that or ready? Okay. Okay, Councilor McNulty. Yeah, I just, uh, you said on others, but I, I think specifically we need to say South Arm and Steveston and okay. possibly if indeed this way, we look at them all at one time. Um, they are community police stations as well. I'm not saying but uh, how they could be transfer transferred at the same time. If we're going to do the work, let's do it all. Okay. That's all. Thank you. 
Councilor Galandres. That would in, that would include cost implications. So what it is, what other services could be integrated in those facilities, starting with Hamilton, including South Arm and Steveston in our community police stations. And so then we could then go forward with that at, at, at that point or not. Um, thanks, all in favor of the referral? Thank you. Okay, and manager's report. Do I have a manager's report? No, nothing to add. Okay, thank you. We're adjourned. And we are adjourned. Thank you.